Today's message will be empowering and life-changing. Hello and welcome to Spirit Empowered Living. I'm Aaron Free and today we're going to be talking about the root and the fruit of disappointment. Have you ever been disappointed? Well, today we're going to look at what's the root of disappointment and what kind of fruit does disappointment bear? But before we get into our topic, we're going to go quickly to the land of Israel And of course, Israel has been in a a war for the last couple weeks, and you might be wondering what's really happening there. A lot of people today say that Israel is occupying that land illegally. Is that a fact? The Jewish people living on that land illegally? Let's look at it. 1917, the end of World War I, the Allied powers had to decide how to divide up the Middle East. Why would they do that? Well, Germany... Austria, Hungary, joined with the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire controlled the entire Middle East. Well, they lost the war. And so after the war in 1917, 1920 rolls around, and the Allied powers joined together in San Remo, France. And they came up with what is known as the San Remo Treaty. They divided the entire Middle East into 22 Arab nations place like Saudi Arabia. When did Saudi Arabia begin as a nation? 1920 at the San Remo Treaty in San Remo, Italy. When did Iraq, when did Iran, when did Niger, Algeria, when were those nations born? 1920 in the San Remo Treaty in San Remo, Italy. Israel at that time, it was born as well. Three years earlier, The Belfort Declaration in Great Britain, Lord Belfort said and declared, it's now time, your majesty, that the Jewish people have a homeland. Well, in 1920, when the Allied powers, these were the the great nations of the world that had conquered Germany and its allies, they decided we're going to divide these nations into nation states, 22 Arab nation states, and we're going to give the Jewish people their own homeland. So the Jewish people received 100% of what was given to Britain to mandate an area of land that they were to mandate. This large land mass included the Golan Heights, Gaza, the West Bank, and all of Transjordan. It was a huge piece of land. Well, Fast forward a few months after the San Remo Declaration, the Arab nations were very unhappy that the Jewish people were receiving their own homeland. Even though 22 uh, Arab nations were broken up out of the Mesopotamian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, well, they were very unhappy that the Jewish people were really going to get their own uh, place, their own state. And so they began to terrorize the Jewish people. And the British said, you know, we don't want a third world war here. So we're going to partition what we promised to the Jewish people. And we'll give it to 300,000 Hashemite Bedouins. And we'll call that area Transjordan. We'll give 85% of the land to the uh, Arabs. And we'll give 15% to the Jewish people. Well, of course, in 1948... In the United Nations Resolution 181, and uh, Israel was declared as a nation state. Five Arab nations that surrounded Israel uh, immediately attacked Israel, said, we're going to push Israel into the sea. Miraculously, the Jewish people won the war. And then in the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur War, they acquired more landmass as years went by and as they continued to be attacked by their surrounding enemies. And here's really how to define the Middle East War in just a few simple phrases. One side, the Arab nations want the Jewish people dead. The other side, the Jewish people, they want to live in peace within their home, own homeland. And so that is what the conflict is all about. One side wants to hate, the other side wants to live in peace. And so it's very important for us these days to understand this is an Islamic jihad against 
the Jewish people. And the Jewish people, of course, are the first line of defense for the entire Western world. The Islamic Jihad movement wants to destroy the West. And they believe if they can literally take out this ally of the United States, the Jewish people in the land of Israel, they will come after us next through acts of terror. This is their goal, is to destroy everyone that will not submit to Allah. And so we really must pray for the land in, of Israel. We must pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Do they have a legal right to exist in that land? Absolutely. Based on the San Remo Declaration of 1920, the Jewish people have the same legal right to occupy that land. And again, the Golan Heights, the West Bank uh, as well, they have the legal right to occupy that land in the same way that, that Saudi Arabia has the legal right to live in their land. You remember in the first Gulf War, it was Iraq that crossed over an international border and attacked Kuwait. And the whole world rose up and said, Iraq, you can't do that because that border was established at the San Remo Treaty in 1920. You can't cross over into that other nation and fight. And so I would pray that the rest of the world, when Hamas and other terrorist organizations are striking out the Jewish people, that we would say, hey, based on international law, you can't cross over that border. This people, the Jewish people, have the right to live in this land just as the Arab nations have the right to live in their land. And so to answer the issue of the Middle East War, one side, the Arab people want to kill Jews. The other side, the Jewish people, they simply want to live in peace. We're going to talk today about disappointment. Have you ever been disappointed? Someone once said that, a disappointment is an appointment that never happened. A friend of mine said that you could say that disappointment should go something like this, dist appointment. And a disappointment is a sense in your heart that I've been dissed from my divine appointment, my purpose. A lot of times we can be disappointed in people. Maybe we're in a marriage situation and we're a guy and our wife let us down and she's not the woman that we thought that we married or you know it's a woman that's married to a man and she's concerned and disappointed that her husband is not changing he's not becoming the man that she thought he would be and so there's a, a disappointment in her heart and disappointment in the husband's heart and oftentimes people grow apart because of living with disappointment circumstances can disappoint you maybe your career isn't going the way that you thought it should go and there's a there's a wound inside a disappointment oftentimes people can become disappointed in God that they feel like God's let them down and God has disappointed them but I want to tell you today that God never disappoints anyone he doesn't disappoint you from your divine appointment because when God gives an appointment he gives a calling upon a person's life. The Bible says the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. He doesn't give something and then take it away. So we can never be dissed from our appointments that God has placed on our hearts. So God never disappoints. He appoints and he reappoints, but he never disappoints. The enemy of our souls, he's working overtime to disappoint us, to take us away from our our God-given purpose to diss us from our divine appointments in life. That's his daily operating procedure is to cause us to live in disappointment. The Bible says in Romans chapter 9, verse 33, these words, As it is written, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him, that's in Jesus, will never be disappointed. What a wonderful passage. I lay in Zion a cornerstone, and whoever trusts in Jesus will never be disappointed. Of course, there'll be disappointments along the way in life. There'll be some troubles along the way and some trials along the way. But when I put my faith in Jesus, I can never, ever, ever, ever be disappointed for my divine appointments. God's going to bring me to my desired harbor. He's going to find a way, even if I get sidetracked, even if I fall back, 
doesn't matter what happens, God is going to bring me one way or the other. So I might as well just start believing now. I might as well just start trusting now because one way or the other, he's going to fulfill the destiny that he's placed in my life. And so whoever trusts in God will never be disappointed. Trusting in Jesus, that, that rock of Zion, the stone of Zion. The opposite is true. If I don't trust in him, the scripture says whoever trusts will never be disappointed. The opposite is true. If I don't trust, if I'm walking in unbelief and I know that God's placed a, a purpose and a destiny in my heart and I just come to the place where I say, it's just not possible. I'm not going to do it. I, I can't see that God could ever fulfill this dream or promise in my life. And so I'm going to walk away in unbelief from the destiny and the purpose that God has given to me, yes, then of course I will be disappointed. But whoever trusts in him will never be disappointed. And I want to talk to you today about the root and the fruit of disappointment. And I truly believe that the root of disappointment is unbelief. Because whoever trusts will never be disappointed. That means to me who's ever walking in distrust or in unbelief, they're going to be disappointed. So the root of disappointment is unbelief. And I'm either going to believe in God's word and believe in God's promises for my life, or I'm not going to believe it. There's no in between. It's, it's a yes or no answer. Do you believe? Yes or no. If I say yes, then, then walk it out. Walk in trust and faith and depend on God that he's never going to let you down. He'll never disappoint you from your purpose. And there was a group of people in the Old Testament. They, they had a great promise. God had given the children of Israel a promise of, of a land flowing with milk and honey. And so Moses, the leader of Israel, he sends in 12 spies to spy out the land. And the 12 come back and they're carrying the, the beautiful grapes and the produce of the land. And 10 of the spies are very negative. They're in absolute unbelief. And two, Joshua and Caleb, they're walking in great faith and belief. And the Bible tells us in Numbers chapter 13, beginning with verse 30, it says this, But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for the, they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. So what a wonderful promise God had given the children of Israel, a land flowing with milk and honey. But the ten spies came back and they said, we don't believe. We don't believe the promises of God are true. This, this vision is way beyond our capacity to fulfill. God must have made a mistake. This cannot be his will. And so they turned against God. Two men said that God was able to help them conquer this land. So in Numbers 14, God says to the children of Israel, all the men over 20 that despise my word, that walked in unbelief, they're going to be highly disappointed because they're all going to die in this wilderness because of the rejection of the promise that I have given them. And so their purpose had to be placed on hold. And the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, Now rise up and go over the brook Zered. So we went over the brook Zered. And the time for our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years until the entire generation, that is, the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. What is God saying here? God's saying, I gave them a wonderful promise. They walked in unbelief. And now from the time they left Kadesh Barnea to they crossed the brook Zered was a time period of 38 years. 38 years of living on hold. 38 years of being stuck on stop. And for those 38 years, they were in sight of the promised land. So close yet so far away. All because of their unbelief. But whoever trusts in the Lord will not be disappointed 
from their divine appointments. So unbelief, I believe, is the root of disappointment. What's the fruit of disappointment? Well, when you stop trusting in God, when he places a purpose in your heart and a divine destiny in your life, and you simply come to the point where you say, with all my issues and problems, that can never be. I, I can't believe in the promises of God. What happens is the, the root of disappointment is unbelief, but that vine of unbelief, it begins to sprout and it begins to bear fruit. And it enters into this, this place of, it's, I think it's almost like a sickness where we become motionless. And I believe the, the fruit of disappointment is self-pity. And if you look at the children of Israel, what did they say? What did the 10 spies say when they came back from the promised land? They said, we're like grasshoppers. There's, there's giants in the land. We're small in their eyes. We, we can't conquer this land. It's, it's impossible for us. The promise is too great. God must not, not have been thinking clearly by giving us this promise. We're like grasshoppers, and we should go back to Egypt. And at least in Egypt, we had a roof over our head, and then they started blaming God. They were so disappointed in their circumstance that self-pity set in. They became motionless, and they began to blame God for their circumstances. And they said of God, he's brought us out here to kill us. And then it's kind of the attitude of, woe is me. Woe is me, all my issues and my problems. You know, the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, beginning with verse 6, it says this, Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So Paul the Apostle here is telling us that whatever happened to Israel in that wilderness experience during those 38 years of wandering, from the time they left Kadesh Barnea until they crossed the brook Zered, those 38 years, that was an example for us to follow. Why? Because, listen, they're like a PowerPoint illustration. If they walked in unbelief and distrust of God and they ended up being uh, set aside in the back burner for 38 years while they had to wait till all the unbelief died out in the camp, that says something to me in my, my walk with Jesus, that ultimately he's going to bring me to the promised land, but I'm either going to walk a, a straight road to get there, or I'm going to take all these detours and place my life on hold and be filled with self-pity and disappointment, but, but I'd rather not do that. I'd rather trust the Lord, cross over into the promised land, and get rid of all my disappointment and self-pity. Self-pity is very destructive. Self-pity destroys everything around it except itself. Self-pity fulfills all of its own prophecies about itself. And it's the worst possible emotion. Self-pity is very addictive. It's more destructive than any non-pharmaceutical narcotic. It's very self-destructive. It separates me from reality, it gives me momentary pleasure. See, it's really good in my flesh to gain other people's sympathy for my, my life circumstances and my problems. But what happens with that is often, you know, for example, a, a husband will come home and, and he'll just start pouring out his, his pity towards himself wanting his wife's sympathy because maybe his job isn't going well and maybe someone was uh, not very kind to him at work. He starts pouring out all of his issues and his offenses. Well, then his wife, she picks up his offense and now she begins to pity herself and the whole family enters into this sickness, motionless sickness of self-pity. You can't go forward, you can't go backwards. You're stuck in this, this momentary place in life where you can't get anything accomplished because you're filled with self-pity and you don't enter into the promises that God has placed 
uh, in your destiny. So uh, there's an old story about a guy who was always complaining about everything and uh, it seemed like the whole world was, was negative. And on top of all that, whenever he slept, he snored. And so his wife, she heard somewhere that if you just put some Lindberger cheese under a man's nose when he's snoring, that it'll stop snoring. And so uh, the husband's in his easy chair and he's sleeping away. And so he starts snoring. His wife goes in the kitchen, gets some Lindberger, which is a very, uh, has a strong odor to it. She puts the cheese under his nose and the man uh, wakes up and he says to his wife, the living room stinks. He walked into the kitchen and he said, the kitchen stinks. He walked into the family room. Honey, the family room stinks. What is wrong with this house? He walked outside. He looked up at the, the beautiful blue sky and he screamed up to God, the whole world stinks. And see, that's what self-pity does to us. It just brings us to a point where we're grumbling and we're complaining about every circumstance that we have in life. And Paul says of the children of Israel, they're in the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that when they grumbled, they were destroyed by the destroyer. You see, I, I firmly believe that self-pity is that destroyer. When I begin to pity myself and grumble about my life circumstances, I'm actually come to a place of, of total destruction. And the Bible says in uh, Psalm chapter 22, it's, it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. You know, David, when he came to places in life where he was discouraged, facing the many disappointments that come our way every day. David never came to a place where he started walking in unbelief and distrust and start proclaiming that, that God wasn't going to help him, that God didn't have any promises to be fulfilled in his life. David's life was, that I can see, was never put on hold for long periods of time. Maybe he went through some temporary grieving, but he moved on. He put the past behind him. He wouldn't allow disappointment he wouldn't allow unbelief and he wouldn't allow self-pity to overcome his life. So in Psalm 22, verse 1, here's what David says. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. What I love about David is he didn't bring all of his issues to everyone else to solve. He brought his disappointments, his pains, his problems to the Lord himself. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from hearing me? But he ends up with that passage and says, Yet I will place my trust in God. And then he talks about the Israel of old. And he said, They trusted in God and they were not put to shame. In other words, they trusted and they were not disappointed. So when I come to that place in my life where I'm discouraged, I can bring my issues to the God of heaven in prayer. Bow my knee and say, Lord, I'm, I'm in trouble. I cry to you, I lift my heart and I cry to you, and I trust in you, and because I trust in you, I know that you'll never disappoint me. So Israel was on hold for 38 years, and after 38 years, they came to a new season. And I believe today you're coming into a new season. And what was the first thing that God spoke to Israel after 38 years of wilderness wandering? God spoke and said, rise up, Pull up your stakes, rise up and go. Cross over the brook Zered. I looked up this Hebrew meaning of the brook Zered, and Zered is the Hebrew word for exuberant fruitfulness. So you're coming into a new season of exuberant fruitfulness. You're going to pick up your stakes from anything in your past. Stop rehearsing all the curses of what's happened in your past. Pull up your stakes and move forward. Cross over the brook Zered into a time of exuberant fruitfulness. And I believe I'm talking to someone right now that is experiencing not only the, the root of disappointment, which is unbelief, but you're experiencing the fruit of disappointment, which is self-pity. 
And it's your time to arise, get moving, stand up, take up your bed and walk. Leave that place of self-pity behind because God has a new season for you. He's bringing you into a new place. Whatever it is that God maybe spoke to you, maybe it was 38 years ago. Maybe you took some detours along the way. Maybe a divorce happened or a bankruptcy happened or maybe you're disappointed in your family or your children. It doesn't really matter because when you start placing your trust in the Lord again, you'll never be disappointed from your divine appointment. He's bringing you into a place of exuberant fruitfulness. Your holding pattern is over. Your time of unbelief and disappointment and self-pity is over. Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's here for you today. He's here for me today. It's time for you to cross over the brook Zared, a time of exuberant fruitfulness. And whatever it is that has happened, remember this, whatever has happened, God will always bring you into the place of your promise. Even if heartache has come in your past, even if you've taken a detour in your past, it says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So I'm going to pray for you today that this is your day of Zared, your day of exuberant fruitfulness, that God would breathe a new season into your life. Lord, I thank you today that we've learned that the root of disappointment is unbelief. So Lord, today we say as David, Lord, I cry to you. I put my trust in you because you're that rock that is of Zion. Anyone who puts their trust in you will absolutely never be disappointed from their divine appointments. You'll never let us down, Jesus. And Lord, today I thank you that not only do we overcome the root of disappointment, but God, today I pray that we'd overcome the fruit of disappointment that may be growing within our hearts, that, that issue of self-pity. And I thank you, Lord, this morning we, we set aside self-pity. We walk away from, from years of possible years of self-pity in our life. We come to that place of exuberant fruitfulness. I pray for my friend today, God, that they'll come into a new season of their life by the power of the Holy Spirit. I ask this in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our wonderful Messiah. Amen and amen. I want to invite you this Sunday morning to Knollwood Church at 1030 a.m. You can go to our website, knollwoodchurch.net. We have a wonderful experience in worship and the Word. It'll be a great time of encouragement for you. God bless you today and thank you for being with us on Spirit Empowered Living. Lord, I receive.